video in a grassland, for instance. So think about that, and uh, time of day and year, and uh, just so these are just silhouettes of birds, and you can obviously tell differences. So before you see any color, you can narrow down um, different things. Uh, Yeah, how about this one? Woodpecker. Yeah. Um, yeah. Eagle. Eagle. Yeah. Um, this one's a little harder. Any guesses? A crow. A crow. I I think it might be a kingfisher. Okay, so um, just wanted to say a little bit about uh, feathers. So now, now that I've told you color's not important, it actually is. So, <laughs> so here's a, uh, can anyone see some birds in this picture? You can shout out if you do. tree branch, and this is a tree branch, but this is a bird right here. It's a, it's a, a tawny frogmouth bird in Australia. It's very well camouflaged. And I, I used this picture for three years teaching, and then one day in class, a student said, there's another one, and I didn't know about it. But here, there's another eye, another beak, um, the head and the body. So there are two tawny frog mounts here, but they're super camouflaged birds. And when you come upon them in Australia, and I finally did actually get to see one there last year, uh, they, as you approach them, they go from a posture like a normal bird posture to gradually going up like this and closing their eyes. And then they have a little slit in their eyes that they can still see out of. With, with their eye mostly closed. So they're thinking, you don't see me here. Um, but anyway, so they're very camouflaged. And then there's other ways to use feathers. So feathers can sort of be any color. And you, so you can make really brightly colored feathers for uh, social reasons, usually, sexual selection. And uh, so to make sense of the colors that you see on birds, you have to get good at some terminology because the books will explain it in these uh, different ways. Um, so there's there's all these different words like supercilium is a is a stripe above the eye, super is above the cilium, the, the eye, and uh, and there's a mustachial stripe, and this is called the breast on a bird, and the, the belly. And then you have different feathers called different things. So you want to uh, learn all those names. And uh, here's a, just a, a lilac breasted roller that I'll use to talk about the wings a little bit. So on the wings of a bird, they're folded up when it's perched like this. But when, uh, when it's flying, you, you can see the, the wings out like this. And, these feathers here, these flight feathers down to here, are called the primaries. And then the secondaries are here, the coverts, um, scapulas, the tertials. Anyway, you're not going to learn all these names today, but it's good to at some point learn them because the, the book will describe, you know, it's got this color on this part and this color on that part. So you need to know those parts. This is a crazy case of sexual selection. The males grow, grow these uh, 
these covert feathers really long right before the breeding season. And the females really like those. And choose the ones with the longest feathers. And then right after they mate and lay the eggs, the male chews off his long feather and they're gone. And uh, because it's sort of a handicap, it's hard to fly with those long things. Um, and then just a few words about molt. <clears throat> um, so birds grow their feathers and then replace their feathers in a certain scheduled pattern over time. And you have to kind of think about this, or when you become an advanced birder, it's good to think about this because birds can look different at different times of the year and, uh, and different times over several years. So the classic example is the gulls around here. The glaucous wing gulls and, and other gulls that you see. By the way, there's no such species as a seagull. That's, that's a broad group. <laughs> but they start out, um, well, if you see a dark gull like that, it's a first year bird. And then as they age, they get um, lighter color. And then they get to the, the really white headed form when they're about four years old. So you can sort of age um, these gulls based on the color that they are. And being aware of that will help you identify which species you're seeing. So if you see one like this and one like this, you might think they're different species, right? Until you become aware that they're, they're actually different ages of the same one. And uh, we can use knowledge of molting patterns on birds to figure out a lot about them. So this is a yellow rump warbler. There's the yellow rump. <laughs> and uh, this wing, it's a little hard to tell, but it has three different ages of feathers on it. All these feathers here, the primaries and the secondaries, were grown when the bird was just a couple months old, just a young bird. And I can tell that because they're a little bit faded. They aren't as dark as some of the other feathers, and they're a little worn on the edge. You can also tell that because it's got two kinds of secondary coverts here. And uh, so, so this one, this one, this one, this one are all similar color and similar width of the white. And then these ones have broader white and so forth. These were grown on the uh, wintering grounds, whereas these were grown on the breeding grounds the year before. And uh, that particular pattern tells us it's a second year bird. If it were a third year bird, all of these would be the same um, general look. And these feathers would be in better condition. So it's kind of cool how we can use knowledge of the molting patterns. And then uh, we can also look at the tail and learn things about how old the bird is and what conditions it's in from the tail feathers. OK, <clears throat> since we're kind of running out of time, uh, I'll talk about how to get close to birds. You want to dress in drab clothing, you don't, and you want to not talk a lot. You know. Um, be kind of quiet when you get close to them. Um, you can use um, bird blinds. Often sitting in one place for a while, the birds will come to you. You know, they won't really know that you're there. And they, it's motion that they really care about. Um, having a feeder is good and looking through a window. Pishing, that's a sound that birders make. It's part of the pathology of birding, but people will make sort of a whoosh, whoosh, sound, and that supposedly gets um, some kinds of birds to come closer. It works well with chickadees, because um, chickadees are really curious about things. And uh, it, it's actually simulating a call that a lot of species use to um, tell each other that there's a predator around. So if you make that sound, a lot of species will think, ah, somebody's saying that there's a predator nearby. I'm going to go see and check it out. And then what they do is mob the predator together. That's, that's cool. You can use more intrusive techniques, um, like uh, imitating a predator. That, so that, yeah, what I was just saying, you can play a screech owl sound off your iPhone or whatever. And um, 
what will happen is chickadees and kinglets and nuthatches and stuff will come and try to look for that predator and mob it and drive it away. And if you pay attention to um, uh, ravens and crows around here, you'll often see them getting chased off by smaller birds. Um, so anyway, that's, it's kind of a, a really interesting reaction that they have to that. You can play um, songs or calls to simulate a territorial intruder. So this is how I actually, in my own research, I catch birds temporarily by setting up a mist net, this big net, and then I play the sound of a male singing. And the, the resident male in the territory then gets angry that another male is invaded and comes in to try to, um, try to drive off the intruder. But I just want to emphasize, you, shouldn't, you should be really aware doing this, don't do it too much. Don't play songs just all over the place. Never do it in an area where there's, you'll disturb endangered species or rare species in general. And um, don't do it where you'll disturb other birders. So if it's a common place like Rifle Bird Sanctuary, I never do this at. I never play songs at, at a place like Rifle Bird Sanctuary or Stanley Park, unless you're really in the remote part of it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's cool. Although I, was, although I watched your video on, on the, uh, the owling, and that was cool. I thought that was great. Yeah, so that was great. <laughs> um, all right. Is, any questions? What does yeah. mobbing mean? Oh, mobbing? Oh, that means that, so these little birds, if they find a screech owl or, a, or some other owl nearby, what they'll do is actually gang up and try to attack it. So it, it seems counterintuitive, right? This small chickadee attacking an owl. But this is what they actually do. And the idea is... What we see today. Did you see that with the barred owl? Yeah, the barred owl. There's a lot of chickadees surrounding it and call yeah. it out. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's what they were doing. They were mobbing. So that's... Um, Try to intimidate it. That's mobbing. And yeah, what they're doing... I mean, a lot of biologists have thought about this. Why do they do yeah. this? But what they're doing, so the owls are, um, are surprise predators. So owls will catch things that don't know that the owl is there, right? They'll swoop down on a bird that's foraging on, for seeds, or they'll swoop down on a little squirrel or something. If the bird knows the owl is there, then the bird is the little bird is in a much better position because the little bird can like hide behind branches. The owl is big, it can't fly just through, through trees. It, it has to have a clear path. So the little bird can kind of um, get in a safe place, but then they'll call and all their friends come in and they all come in and they annoy the owl. And so they're annoying the owl in two ways. One, they'll actually attack it, like they'll come down and try to bite its feathers, like they'll do this. Sometimes they'll, um, not chickadees, but um, crows and other things will sometimes actually defecate on a predator. They'll, they'll try to shit on it. Yeah. <laughs> I just said that on, on video. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, so, so that's one way they're annoying it. The other way is they're letting the predator know that, hey, we see you. We know you're here, so you're not going to surprise us because we know you're here, right? Um, it's this, probably the same reason white-tailed deer, when if you're driving along a road and, and you see a white-tailed deer, the tail goes up and it waves like this. It's a bright white tail. Why is the deer making itself so visible? Well, it's probably saying to the predator, I see you. I know you're there. So don't chase me because I already, I'm already running. So that's that's probably what's going on. Any other questions? Um, okay, I just wanted to say if you're if you want to read some really good stories about the more pathological kind of birding, where people get so into it that they sell all their possessions and they they just quit their jobs and they take off for a year. Um, this, this book is a fantastic book by Ken Kaufman called Kingbird Highway. And he, uh, this was back in the 70s, 
he um, was a teenager, and I think for a total dollar amount of $800, he hitchhiked all over North America, and he ended up seeing more species in a year than anyone ever had. And it's just a great book, and each chapter starts with a map of where he traveled during that chapter, and it's like from Alaska to Florida, next chapter Florida to Arizona, next Arizona to, to New York. And he's just all over uh, the place. And he did it mostly um, eating cat food and hitchhiking. <laughs> so really budget traveling. And then this one, the big year, this is more about um, three people who were all competing, I think in the late 90s, 1997, they were competing to see the most species in the year. One person won, and the, the movie's about that. And uh, Vancouver's a great place for, for birding because um, we have a lot of species that breed here, and then we have a lot of species that winter here, and then a bunch of others that just pass by here during migration. So there's a bunch of things that um, breed up in Alaska and winter down in Mexico, but they'll pass through on this West Coast flyway. These are the major flyways in North America. They'll come through.